Welcome to Sideline Sanity with Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There's never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. Coming up, Dave Rubin. He'll talk about anything. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Welcome to Sideline Sanity. I'm Michelle Tafoy. I'm so excited to have Dave Rubin with us today. I mean, I don't know how to describe you, Dave, that would put that would encompass all of what you do into one title. I mean, you've done stand up. You're a writer. You you can you have a podcast. You have these. What are you, Dave? How do you call yourself? Well, you know, I'm a singer. I'm a dancer. I can paint. <laughs> uh, they say only a few people uh, from Hollywood can do all of those things. You know, they say Matthew McConaughey, Barbara Streisand, and me. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, I mostly, I mostly consider myself some guy who talks for a living about yeah. the things that are kind of going on in the world, and I'm trying not to make people crazy more than anything else because we live in a crazy time and so many of the people who do what we do for a living, they, they are trying to feed the craziness all the time. I'm really trying not to. I'm not always perfect at it, for sure. Uh, but I'm not trying to make my audience any more angry about everything. And I think uh. if I've done one good thing over the couple of years uh, that this thing really has taken off, it's that the nicest thing that people say to me all the time now when I meet people on the street or at Whole Foods or wherever, they say, Dave, you've helped keep me sane. And it's like uh, the world's pretty insane. So I take that as a high compliment. That's a high compliment. That's why we have you on Sideline Sanity. You are going to bring sanity to sanity, this. Sanity, there you go. There you go. We're going to bring sanity to it. We want to talk about your books too. But we're going to kind of approach this. You, you do this great thing where people can jump online and ask you anything. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to dive in because as you said, we're living in crazy times. So your approach to the world, obviously you've got this sense of humor. You've got this this ability to laugh at certain things when you wake up each day and you know, you're approaching a crazy world. How do you frame your mind to take it on each day? First off, just on the, you know, the sense of humor thing, you know, when we were on Gutfeld a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about racist baby, the book racist baby. <laughs> and I turned to Gutfeld and I said, Oh, I thought that was the tagline for this show. And then I turned <laughs> to you for the high five live on TV. And I was like, she better give it to me and you timed it perfectly. It was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful just, moment. Just fantastic. Um, you know, my, my general approach is that I'm trying to enjoy my life throughout all of this nonsense. And, yeah. you know, I just moved to Florida six months ago after eight years in Los Angeles. I'm originally a New Yorker. And for six years in LA, it was pretty good. And then the last two years because of COVID and lockdowns, it was, it was pretty miserable, even though my life was pretty good. You know, I have right. a certain uh, amount of money. Like I can basically do what I want. I've got great people around me. I'm in a good relationship. I have the stuff that I want, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, being around the craziness of the lockdowns and then the crime and the homelessness and the drugs and all that stuff, it was becoming depressing. And I started realizing that it was really affecting me in a weird way. I was happy within the four walls of my home, but then I'd go out to the store and between the masks and the general sense of malaise, I just wasn't happy. And, and in the six months of Florida, it's like, I, I don't know that I've ever been this happy or, or it's not even about happy, really. It's just sort of this full, like knowing that yeah. I'm doing the right thing that I'm supposed to be doing in the place that I'm supposed to be doing it. So when I wake up in the morning, well, I mean, more than anything else, I, well, I pee real quick and then uh, I have to have some, <laughs> I have to have some coffee. I have right. to have some coffee. You do not want me without coffee. It ain't pretty. Oh, there you go. I got mine yeah. right here too. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, what we, the way we always start the day actually is we take a walk with our dog and we try not to have phones with us. So we take about a half hour walk, hopefully if the weather's, you know, cooperating and just kind of, not, we don't talk politics. We don't, we don't, it's just like, what's going on? What's going on in the world? What's going on in our lives? As I told you right before we started, we got some home construction going on right now. So just 
Yeah, just if the, you hear the, drilling in the background, yeah. just you know, it's fine. It's it's we totally accept home improvement on this show. Oh, thank you. Yeah, drilling could be glass breaking, cement being poured. <laughs> I don't know, whatever it might be. Um, but but I try to set the intention of the day of like, yeah, I'm gonna deal with some nonsense. You know, I'm talking about the the administration and the nonsensical media and just the lies that were fed all day long. And that can be frustrating at times, you know, when I have to go through clips of like another politician lied about this and they lied about this and this happened, it can be depressing or there was a shooting or there was whatever. Yeah. But I try to just take everything in stride. It's like, you know, bad things have happened before, bad things yeah. are gonna happen again. And if you keep a little perspective on it, then you won't go crazy. You will stay somewhat sane throughout all of this. You and I share something in common in Th that we love the inside of our homes and our four walls and the people around us. You're about to welcome some children, which is such happy news. And you've got your dog, of course, and which is always a good thing because they just look at you and you can't help but smile. But, you know, you find you, you get to a point in life where you, you feel comfortable, you know, you're happy with what you have in your immediate surroundings. And some people would say, well, then you're just out of touch. You don't understand what all of us are going through. You don't understand what it's like to be black. You don't understand what it's like to be, you know, a trans. You don't understand what it's like to be poor. And so therefore you are sort of an enemy. You're, you're villainized. Do you find that? Do you hear that? Well, I would say the problem is on them, not on me. I mean, you know. I agree with that. And what do you do with that? What do you do with it? You, you live the best life that you can live and you hopefully just push out the ideas that you think are the right ideas. And then if they are the right ideas, then hopefully they can, you know, they can cause some growing in other people's minds. That's the basic idea. Right. I don't know what it's like to be black. I don't know. Um, I happen to be gay, uh, you know, all right, zippity doo dah. I don't want any extra credit for that. <laughs> I want equality for that. I don't need extra credit. Um, you know, it's like we're, we all have things that are either good about us, different about us, bad about us, weak about us, strong about us, depressing about us, exciting about us, all of those things. It's your job as a human being to like take all of that stuff. Boy, I was born into a really rich family. That's great. Well, it doesn't mean you're going to be rich. It doesn't mean you're going to have to do anything with money and you might run the whole family business into the ground. You might be born with nothing or born to abusive parents or alcoholic parents or whatever. And you might figure out a way to thrive in life because you realize you have to depend on yourself or it might be too much and it might lead you down a dark path that was set before you. That is all the gestalt of life, that, the, that it's uneven, it's unequal. The best the society can do is create the conditions that there's equal, and equal enough opportunity. And that's what we've done really well in the United States. So I'm not that interested. You know, when I, I'll go to colleges and kids will be screaming, you don't know what it's like to be black. You don't know what it's like to be trans. And it's like, all right, but I know what it's like to be a citizen of the United States. I know what it's like to be a free thinking individual who wants to fight for people to be free. Um, and I don't think that your perceived oppression, because mostly it's perceived, it's not real. I don't think right. that makes right. you any more valuable. So it's like, I just did this on my show this morning, but you know, we're in the middle of pride month. I mean, first off, the idea that any yeah. month would, first off, that any of these things have a month is ridiculous, whether to me it's pride month or, black, or black month or, or Jewish month or any of them would be all, all equally ridiculous to me. But there's something particular about pride that seems crazy to me because pride, if you're proud, you don't have to run around screaming how proud you are. When you meet a proud person, <laughs> they're not telling you that they're proud. You know it. Pride is earned. It's internally earned. Yeah. And then it, it resonates, it, it, it reverberates outside of you. So these people that have to scream about how proud they are all the time, it's like, I'm not so sure that's really what's going on there. I think thou doth protest too much about your pride. It, exactly. it, that's really interesting. I, I, I sit back and I go, you know, there are 12 months in the year and we've decided to divvy them up. You know, there's Hispanic history month, women's history month, which I, I, I don't like, like you, it's like, I don't, to me, it's like, if you want to celebrate women, do it every day, all year long, whatever, and do it through your actions. We don't, have, but some people really believe in taking a moment to celebrate these things. So, you know what, go ahead, do that. If it makes you feel good, that's fine. But uh, you know how we only have, we've decided how these 12 months are going to be divvied up. 
you know, and then we've got 365 days of donut day and hot dog day and coffee day and ice cream day. It's uh, it's it's kind of funny. It's humorous. I, I, I'm, I think it's commercial more than anything. Well, it's commercial more than anything, and it shows how everything's become political because it's not really about Women's Month being about pride for women. It's about some sort of political connotation attached to women, right? Or right. or Black Pride Month or or Gay Pride Month. These are obviously very political things, not necessarily about the pride for being a woman or something like that. And since you're a you're a former NBA girl, I think I told you this during the commercial break at Gutfeld, but my dog who you mentioned before, uh, my dog is Clyde and he's named after Clyde the Glide Drexler who played on the Blazers and the Rockets in the late 80s and early 90s. And I so I don't watch basketball anymore. I love basketball. I have a basketball court. I love playing, but I don't watch the NBA anymore because it became so politicized. So when I'm doing cardio now, I actually watch old games. Uh, from the 80s. I watched the Magic and Larry years. I oh, watched the yeah. Jordan years. That's what I watch on YouTube all the time. So I was re-watching uh, the 92 finals, and that's the Jordan shrug year. Remember, the Jordan mm-hmm. hits the 6-3, Cliff Robinson yep. crumbles on the floor. And because I was a Blazer fan, because I love Clyde, it's a very sad moment for me. But anyway, I'm watching that. And if you remember that 92 year, that was the year of the Rodney King uh, yep. verdicts in LA and the riots, and the Blazers were playing the Lakers in the first round. And they had to move, they couldn't play in LA because of the riots and they had to move it to UNLV for one of the games because the riots were so bad down in Inglewood. So they're interviewing Clyde uh, during halftime of the finals about what had gone on for those couple weeks. And they're asking him, you know, for his opinions on politics and race and all of this stuff. And he just really wouldn't answer it. He was like, he was, oh, and they do, the big thing that they kept saying was, I think it was Mark Stein, if I'm not mistaken, was the reporter. And he kept saying, well, my, you know, people want Michael Jordan to be more outspoken. Why don't you think Michael Jordan's being more outspoken about race and blah, blah, blah? And Clyde, and I'm watching this, and I'm like, oh, man, this is my lifetime hero. Don't drop the ball on this one, Clyde. <laughs> I'm like, don't, you know, this. I know this is 30 years ago, but don't disappoint me, man. And I'm very proud to say he didn't. He said, you know, we bust our butts out there to be the best that we can be in the gym eight hours a day to play basketball at night, to deal with the media, blah, blah, blah. He's like, Michael just may not want to jump in on this right now. And and I thought it was so freaking refreshing. It was not yeah. a defense of racism. It was not right. a defense of police shootings. But I was like, man, that's how it was supposed to be. And it was one of those moments where I just exhaled because I was like, that's what I used to love about all of this because it had nothing to do with uh, all the stuff that we're so focused on now. And we are so focused on it. One of my theories is, and by the way, I remember those the Rodney King verdict. I was working in L.A. at the time. I remember when it came down, we were crowded around a little television set in this office, this production office where I was working. And as soon as it came down, I said, you guys, there are going to be riots. And so sure enough, within a half hour, there was this curfew place. We were all sent home. And my normal 35 minute drive from Santa Monica to Hermosa Beach took three and a half hours. It it was this mass exodus. Yeah. And then there were fires. and, and, And this was the turning point for me from having grown up in Southern California in Manhattan Beach, very fortunate, uh, you know, m- middle class family. We did not live on the beach. Just want to make that clear. We lived in the tree <laughs> section. Which but if you did grow class. up on the beach, I wouldn't hold it against you. That well, most likely you. meant that your parents did some good stuff. That's pretty exactly, awesome. Exactly. Exactly. There's a very, very funny story about that, but I won't go there. But the point is that that I remember it, and I remember it being so awful in L.A. around that time. And I witnessed a shooting and I said, I got to get out of here. And I, and I, my family's still there. My mom still lives back there. My brother, my sister, I haven't been back. I mean, I go back to visit, but I, I, I just, it was off. It was an awful time. And it was just, it, it really changed my whole view of LA. But anyway, it was a terror. The whole thing was awful. It, it, let's be honest. The whole thing was awful. Okay. So we didn't want to turn in this direction. So I, instead I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, cause he says he'll answer anything. Ask Dave Rubin anything. I'm going to in just a second. Summer grilling is upon us. La! And uh, if you're looking for the perfect cuts to put on the grill this year, look no further than Good Ranchers. It's the place to get American beef, chicken, and fish this summer. They sell 100% American meat and Ship it straight to your door. And right now they're giving away two free 18 ounce prime center cut ribeyes to every person that uses my code TAFOYA, T-A-F-O-Y-A. That's over two pounds of prime ribeye steaks. Just 
added to your order at no cost to you. You are welcome. With Father's Day coming up and all the summer events you've got planned, you need a box of good ranchers. You just do. Your dad, your grandfather, your father-in-law, your friend's father, they all need these ribeyes. You can make a one-time purchase or subscribe and that'll save you 25 bucks a box. Plus, like I said earlier, those two free 18 ounce boneless ribeyes. I mean, these things are so good. They are restaurant quality. Other places would charge you 50 or 60 bucks per steak to get ribeyes like these, but Good Ranchers is giving them to you for free when you go to goodranchers.com slash Tafoya. They are out of their ranching minds. This is not the time to wait. Claim your ribeyes today before they run out because, yeah, it's a limited stock item. First come, first serve, and you want to be first when it comes to good ranchers. They deliver the best of American farms and ranches to your door. Make sure you take time today right now to go to goodranchers.com slash Tafoya or use my code Tafoya, T-A-F-O-Y-A, at checkout to get your two free 18 ounce ribeyes. Start the summer off right with Good Ranchers. American meat delivered. Back with Dave Rubin, who told me nothing's off limits. Okay. Did you see Joe Biden on Kimmel? Ugh. I- <laughs> I did see it. I mean, it's 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 pathetic, but it's sad. It's it funny, sad. but it's horrific. I mean, I, you know, one of my grandmothers who I spent a lot of time with in New York City, um, I lived. I happened to live the closest to her. So when she was in, in in her later years, she did develop dementia, and I was taking to her to a lot of doctors, the cognitive doctors, the geriatric doctors, all of that stuff, and the things that Joe Biden was doing last night were the exact same things. This thing where you're saying a sentence, you start losing the words, then you sort of reset. And then what I really noticed that was sort of even more disturbing, and we've all known something's not right with him for for quite some time, but the way Jimmy Kimmel kept saving him. Did you notice that? Yeah. You're watching him and it's as if he's walking off a cliff and he doesn't know exactly what he's doing, but you can see he's losing it. He's confused. And then Jimmy Kimmel kept picking up his sentences. At one point, basically threw it a commercial so that it would make it seem as if Joe Biden completed a thought. He even lost his train of thought while he was talking about how their messaging has not been good. He's like, the messaging hasn't been good. And then he lost his message within that. So there's like a funny version of it, of course, because because the fact that you have to laugh at some of this stuff. Yeah. But the other the unfunny version is that this guy is supposedly in charge of the world, of the free world. And he obviously has cognitive decline. I mean, the thing that I keep saying about it really is that the scandal is the non-scandal. Right. Because Jimmy Kimmel knows there's something wrong with him. Yeah, the does. only reason they put him on Jimmy Kimmel's show is so that they could pre-tape it, edit it, you know, fully package it. And think about that, Michelle. That was the best that they could put out there. Right. Because they edited yeah. that. This wasn't right. live. No. That was the best of it. And it was a disaster. Um, he also completely lied about the economy. I mean, he just lied about everything. And it's a little unclear if he knows he's lying or if he's just babbling yeah, or you know, whatever. Right. But it, the, the, the broader point though, is that he doesn't know what he's doing. And the scandal is the non-scandal in that everyone knows. Jimmy Kimmel (laughs) knows, the staff knows, someone's medicating him, the the CIA or the Secret Service, whatever it is, they all know. And at some point, it is going to take down the administration. It has to, because at some point, something is going to happen. He is going to have one of those episodes and someone won't be there to save him. And then what I think will ultimately happen is somebody like Barack Obama is gonna be on 60 Minutes and he's gonna say something like, you know, Joe Biden does seem like he's lost a step or two. And then that will be the signal for the media to say that it's okay to talk about, as opposed to all of us talking about it online. The media always needs a signal. Remember when we weren't allowed to talk about the Wuhan lab leak, but then Jon Stewart suddenly went on Colbert (laughs) and then everyone could talk about it, right? Yeah, you have to get permission from the right people, you know? Bingo. Bingo. And the right people are always uh, determined by, it seems to me, the left-leaning media. It's ironic. The right <laughs> people are determined by the left. Ooh, that is ironic. I'm glad you took that yeah. little twist. All right, one more quick break. We're going to talk uh, to Dave Rubin about his book, Don't Burn This Country. It's the second of his, his first book was Don't Burn This Book which I did because I had an extra copy and I needed to Oh, excellent. You should have videotaped that. I would have retweeted it. I should have. I know. That would have been good. (laughs) More with Dave Rubin in one second. (laughs) 
You know, since last November, the stock market has plummeted, but gold has been on the rise. Gas prices are insanely ridiculous. The stock market is so volatile, you can't even look at it. Inflation is worse than it was a year ago. And we've got this war between Russia and Ukraine that hopefully doesn't spread any further. But here's the bottom line. The markets do not like instability. But the good news is you have options. Gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold for protection. Gold provides a hedge against inflation and protects against a weakening dollar. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to invest in gold and silver. You need an investment that's going to protect your wealth and your retirement. Call Legacy Precious Metals today. Be proactive while there's still time, because remember that year 2008? Those who invested in gold saw gains, big gains, while others lost their retirements. Legacy Precious Metals can advise you on all your options for investing in gold and silver. So why not just call them? Get your questions to them. You can speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals, 866-528-1903, 866-528-1903, or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. What do you have to lose? Don't Burn This Country is the name of Dave Rubin's book. All right. So you again, did you start in stand-up comedy? Oh, yeah. The week after I got out of college in May of 98, I was like, oh, I guess I have to get a job. I'm in the real world. I was like, I'll be a comedian. And I went to uh, basically an open mic, or I think I had, we called it a bringer show back then. You had to bring, if you would bring two or three friends to the show oh, yeah. to buy two drinks, they'd throw you on stage. And I kind of crushed it my first night out there, which a lot of times comedians do because you don't even know how to screw up yet. Right. So right. it's like just that initial thing of going out there, not even really knowing what you're doing. And then I did stand up in New York with a lot of the successes and failures of it for 12 years or so. I did the road yeah. for a while. I started a couple comedy clubs with some other comedians where we split all the profits six nights a week, standing out in Times Square barking. I'm sure you've walked by those people. Two hours a night, rain nor sleet nor snow would stop us. Uh, one night, we're in a massive blizzard in New York City. Massive blizzard. They had shut down the city. And I'm standing in Times Square. I'm wearing two pairs of pants so that I could do stand-up. You know, I got a jacket, gloves, the whole thing, hat. I'm standing in Times Square. There's nobody out there because it's a massive blizzard. But I'm just, you know, we're just trying to get four people to show up so that we can tell a couple jokes. We don't make any money on it, nothing. And my phone rings and it's my roommate. And he says, Dave, uh, I'm watching WPIX Channel 11 in New York right now. He said, they're doing a broadcast from Times Square where they're talking about how nobody should be outside and the city's shut down. And I see you standing behind the guy handing out tickets to the comedy show. So that is the life, that is the glorious lifestyle of a comedian. If comedy, if stand up comedy is done in an empty Times Square, is, does anyone hear it? It's like if a tree falls, you know, no one's there to no, hear comedy. No, I really think happen? I know no the answer heard? is no to that okay, one. Okay, okay. That's commitment though. Man, uh, you know, yeah. I, I always hear about the life of stand-up comedians and it's just, it's it it's drives people like me to think, yeah, I'd never do that. But I, I commend you and the fact that you made a living. Um, and so then what kind of transpired in your life to turn you toward these books? Well, it was a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that happened was, so I started stand-up, as I said, in 98. And after 10 or so years, I realized that nobody was moving out because what happened was, you know, back in the old days with stand-up, it was like, if you were a stand-up, say in 80s or 90s, basically you got five minutes, you perfected your five minutes. And if you were, if you were halfway decent, you didn't even have to be great. You could get to The Tonight Show and you'd sit down with Johnny Carson. And if Johnny liked you, you got a sitcom. I mean, that's how it went for Jerry Seinfeld and Louis Anderson and Ellen DeGeneres, yep. and virtually every big name comic of the last 40 years, that's how it happened for them. You can almost go through everybody. Howie Mandel, the entire long list, Tim Allen, everybody, right? So, but what happened was by, by the early 2000s, mid 2000s, first off, television really changed because the idea was you would do stand up and then you'd get a sitcom and then you're, you were made. Ray yeah. Romano, I mean, everybody, right? But sitcoms had stopped. So there weren't many of them anymore. What was taking over was reality TV. So all of these comedians that had spent their lives trying to get the sitcom, get, you know, perfect the stand-up to get the sitcom, they weren't getting the sitcom. So they were all stuck at the clubs. And the club is the gym, really. You want to get out of the gym so that you can yeah. play in the pros. 
But all of the guys that were ahead of me, there was this generation of comedians that were ahead of me, none of them were going anywhere. So the clubs became really, it was a glut at the clubs. And I, for, for whatever reason, I saw that very early on. And I started thinking, this doesn't make sense. Why am I trying to perfect five minutes to get on The Tonight Show, which by the way, then Johnny Carson had left. It was already Leno. Leno, although I've come to like Leno more in my later years because of how apolitical he was, he never really helped anybody. There's no stories, as far as I know publicly. Johnny Carson, it was well known, like he's gonna get you going. Right. There were very, I don't know of any stories, literally none, that Leno like brought someone onto the show and then I'm, I'm sure he did things behind the scenes or whatever, but I just realized the machine didn't seem like it was working anymore. So I was like, I gotta figure out another way to do this. Then fortunately, that's when YouTube was kicking in, podcasts were just starting. And I was very early in on all of that. I honestly had no freaking clue what I was doing. I had a podcast. I didn't even know what a podcast was, honestly. <laughs> People would come up to me on the street. I'm not kidding. People would come up to me. Hey, I'm listening to your podcast right now. I would be like, how do you download it? I don't even know. <laughs> but I knew oh. how to sit in a room with the microphone and have somebody yeah. else do the technical part, which actually is right. pretty much what I'm doing now. So and okay. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, so this is all happening, and then there's there's there is sort of a political side to you, right? I mean, oh, clearly, yeah. what was it? A moment? Was it an event? Was it a, a, a what was it that that turned you toward writing your first book? Yeah, well, I was always sort of political. My family was always political. Nobody was involved in politics directly, but you know. My mom was in PTA. My dad was always talking politics. My family was always arguing about politics. I come yeah. from a New York, Long Island home. Like, it was like, that's what people did. It was just like arguing about everything all the time. And then dinner, you know, dessert was served and everybody was good to go. That's the way it used to be yeah. in America, that people could do that without, yeah. you know, everybody storming out of the house or swearing to never talk to anybody again or canceling people, et cetera. Um, so I was always sort of political in that sense. I was a poli-sci major in college. And then, uh, then politics, I was always interested in the media side too. When I was doing stand-up, I was making jokes about, tw about CNN 20 years ago. You know, all the stuff that everyone's <laughs> making fun of now. When I look at Ahead my of your comedy, time, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was making fun of Wolf Blitzer and all those guys way <laughs> back when. And how that they, I, you know, I used to do something about how uh, they make up all their sources. You know, a, a, an unnamed source on Capitol Hill told me. And it's like, who are you talking about? The janitor? Like, what, yeah. what are we really talking about here? that they made up everything. So it was all sort of obvious to me in a weird way early. Uh, and then, you know, in these last 10 years, politics just kind of infected everything. everything. So then, because I was already doing the online thing and I was already interested in politics, once politics infected everything, I guess that's where my career really kind of took off because then what I was doing sort of went mainstream, I suppose, in a way. Yeah, yeah. You were sort of ahead of the curve, I, I would say. Because, you know, some people are just jumping in this now as though, wow, the political arena is the place to be and to be heard. And if you can be funny about it or you can be angry about it or you can hit just the right note that somebody wants to hear, you know, you can make it. Um, but is, don't burn this country surviving and thriving in our woke dystopia. I mean, it's in a way it does feel like dy it, it, dystopian. It does to me. I. I'll just share with you really quick that a couple hours ago, I was a guest on a podcast that was an awful experience mm -hmm. I, right out of the gate. It was awful. And uh, I thought to myself, where the hell am I? I mean, we're not having a conversation here at all. I'm just being accused of stuff. I, I don't even know what they're talking about. And they Did are you know what you were walking into? No, not at all. Not at all. So it was a bit of an ambush too. And I, and I thought to, and all the while, the macro question in my head was, how the hell did we get here? Like, I, one of the guys on the podcast I've known for many years, we, we covered sports at the same time, yada, yada. And I was like, how did we get here? Were these, I, I've gotten on a Zoom with these guys and they've already decided they hate me and yep. what I stand for. And they don't even really know me. Yep. And so I do feel like we're burning the country. And so when you're saying don't burn it, how do we put out the fire, man? It's, it's, it's happening. Well, that's, that's really what the book's about, how to put out the fire, because you're right. We shouldn't burn it. And there's been something really, really great here for 250 years that is the greatest political experiment in human history. That's what mm -hmm. the United States is, that anyone from any corner of the earth 
could come here and build a better life for themselves. And basically it worked for everybody. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt, Michelle, your life is better than your grandparents' life. Mm -hmm. My parents, uh, my life is way better than my grandparents' life. Every single person watching this. Sometimes I'll go and when I do a public talk somewhere, I'll poll people, I'll say, does anyone in here have it worse than their grandparents? And only one time, I've done this dozens and dozens of times in front of thousands of people, only one time someone raised their hand and he kind of did it as a joke, but he's like, actually, my, grand, my great grandparents were in the oil biz in California in the 1930s and you know we, the family lost the fortune. And it's like, okay, I found one guy and that yeah. actually is true and the family went bust. Okay, so be it. But the point is, it doesn't matter where you came from, whether, whether you're Hispanic or Irish or Jewish or from the West Indies or anywhere else, you came here with pretty much nothing. You know, very few people came here with anything. And they fought and worked hard. And, you know, for me on both sides, it was my great grandparents, but both of my grandfathers had to fight in World War II. I mean, I get to talk for a living. That's what my grandfathers had to do. So I think a little appreciation for some of that is good. And then really the, the main antidote that I lay out in the book is take some responsibility for your life. You know, it does not matter if you think people are mean and it does not matter if people misgender you or use the wrong pronouns or any of those things. If you take offense to that, that's on you. You got a chance in this world to do something good. How about you go out there and do it and see what happens? And, uh, you know, I toured with Jordan Peterson for a year and a half and he would often talk about, you know, that star in the distance. Uh, when you wish upon a star, he would talk about that from Pinocchio. And it's like, you know, when you see that star in the distance, if whatever that is to you, if you go to that, if you go to that thing, you may not get exactly that thing, but you will get somewhere approximately close to it and it will probably be pretty good. And I think that that's pretty much what I've done. Amen to that. And I, I believe in it. I believe in agency. I believe in, I really believe in if you are going to be offended by someone, you're complicit in it because it's your choice to be offended by stuff. It's, yes, it's, you it know, is whether, on you. it is on you, but people do not want to hear that. And they are so quick to just spit venom back at you when you suggest that, uh, you know, we were talking about the don't say gay bill, which nowhere in that bill does it say don't say gay. And I said, I don't think it's homophobic to decide that kids between the ages of eight and 12 or whatever it is, uh, it doesn't need to be in the curriculum, this stuff, you know, let's save that till later, but that's offensive. Well, I, I don't know what to tell you. It, it is homophobic. No, it's not. It's just asking for this not to be in the curriculum. Why is it important to teach young kids this? And, and they, they are so firm in their belief that I don't know that any book, any lecture, any cool breeze is going to help these people change their minds. And I'm not sure I should worry about those people, but I well, do. Well, you, you can't. You can't to some degree, right? Because, you know, if you keep going to the pot and you keep burning yourself on the pot, at some point you got to stop going there. Yeah. And these people are operating at a temperature that it makes it very difficult to reach out to them. You can try to calmly explain to them, well, actually, the, gay, the word gay is not in the bill. This is about K through third graders. This is also really about transparency because they don't, what the main purpose of the bill is that you wouldn't want a teacher, a male or female, straight or gay teacher talking to any child of any gender about sexuality privately and then hiding it from the parents. We all right. know that's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone with their head on even remotely straight knows that's true, knows right. that's true. And this but is coming from is, a gay man, ladies and gentlemen. Because no, because, because think about it. I have a seven-year-old niece who lives here in Miami. I went to her birthday party a couple weeks ago. We were making slime. You know about the slime that the kids are doing? Yeah, you know oh about yeah. The slime? They yeah. love the slime. So I'm in a room with all of these kids, right? And my beautiful niece, everyone's making slime. The idea that there would be a state educator or anyone else that would talk to her about sex or gender or gender identity. I can't, as her uncle, I cannot even imagine even remotely referencing anything related to sex or gender to her. It would be, it would be insane. She knows there's a difference between boys and girls. Yeah. She knows that. But if I, but so the idea that a state educator would think that they have the right to not only talk about that stuff, but do it privately and hide that information. So this has nothing to do with gay. I mean, that's the irony. And as you yeah. probably know, I, I just finished up my book tour. I mean, I did my last stop in Orlando with Ron DeSantis in front of a thousand people. The guy freaking congratulated me on having kids 
Uh, he took a picture with me and my husband. Couldn't be nicer. This yeah. has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. It's it's amazing to me how distorted it gets, how angry people are, and that that the the feelings, the passion, the anger, and by the way, the the people I was talking to didn't have kids, which I think unless you until and unless you know children have nieces, nephews of that age, like you talked about your niece. And certainly it started for me with my niece and nephews. It, it's, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, what this all means, what, how it, it, just look at kids for God's sakes, look at them. They're little, they're innocent. Why does this need to be in their curriculum? It doesn't. So if we can just wait until fourth grade, I think, I think that should be okay. Yeah. I mean, and we can have an honest discussion of when that should be. I mean, I remember I'm 45, so I remember when I was in seventh grade, that's when we had health. Yeah. And I remember, I literally remember the teacher coming in and took a banana and a condom and we all were <laughs> cracking up. We thought it was the funniest thing ever, right? Like, well, I don't know what this woman's doing with the banana, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we can have an honest discussion of, is that okay for seventh grade? Should parents be able to opt their kids out? Is that right. too early? Is it too late? Like there is an honest discussion about health and sexuality that and what public the role of public education actually is but meanwhile they've got freaking drag queen hour at public schools and it's like uh do you guys learn math do you learn math and i'm pretty sure they don't because they think two plus two is five yeah yeah uh, yeah the percentage of kids who are not reading at grade level is embarrassingly low and we're supposed to be this country that prizes education it's it's frustrating to me but you know what's not frustrating don't burn this country. And you, Dave Rubin. I mean, seriously, it's a breath of fresh air. I love it when people can have a sense of humor about all of this stuff, because as the people at Whole Foods say to you, it does keep you sane. It keeps you grounded. It keeps you hopeful that there is still sort of this universe of people out there that wants to be able to laugh at all this at the end of the day and just go home and be with their families and have hope and be happy and pursue that star, that whatever that star is. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because that's sort of how I end my show these days. I'm always trying to give people something at the end. And I, I joked the other day, it's like, I'm starting to feel like Jerry Springer at the end. <laughs> Remember Jerry Springer when he had that show? It was like chaos for an hour, you know? Yeah. You banged my husband and you know, people <laughs> fight, throwing chairs, beating the crap out of each other. And then at the end, he would get up there and he'd be like, you know, be good to each other, everybody. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, aren't you the circus guy who just had right. the fat woman cracking the other guy over the head with the chair? And, the, you know, and it's like, I'm starting to feel like it's a little bit of what I'm doing now. Like I'm dealing with all of this crazy nonsense, but at the end of the day, it's like, if you can hopefully find, you know, somebody that you're happy with that, you know, you can have dinner with and, and maybe have kids or walk the dog with and find something on Netflix that you like, pretty good. That's pretty good. A great way to end. Dave, thanks so much. Good luck with the book. I don't think you're going to need luck, but it was great talking to you. I hope we can do it again. We absolutely will. I'll get you on my show, and I hope to see you with uh, that racist baby sometime soon. Yeah, I think we'll we'll join at the racist baby office again in the near future. <laughs> it sounds great. Thank you, right. everyone. This has been Sideline Sanity with the very sane Dave Rubin. Check out his book, Don't Burn This Country. Uh, it's fantastic stuff. Enjoy the day. So with the economy the way that it is, which is not great, makes you think about what is smart investing these days. I was given a gift of gold by my mom. My husband and I were gifted some gold for a wedding anniversary and we're really grateful. And I am really grateful to Charles Thorngren, who, grow, who joins us now from Legacy Precious Metals, a sponsor of Sideline Sanity. Charles, we appreciate you so much. You know, we're hearing more and more about how inflation ain't transitory after all, and it may be here a while. And, you know, food shelves are getting, the lines are longer. It, this is really, it's not the America I grew up in, and it's, it's worrying a lot of people. So if, if someone's thinking about investing, what do you tell them? You, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Investing nowadays, uh, we, we want to go back to kind of the basics, really, where diversification has always been key and and we hear it we've been told it ad nauseum you know diversify diversify and then everyone puts all their money in the stock market and wonders <laughs> why when there's a pullback they're in trouble 
Diversity means asset class diversity as well. You know, some real estate, um, some precious metals. These are the things that gives your portfolio the legs to stand through all the storms that will happen financially. And, and, and we know that they happen. They happen continuously and they recur. So that's what diversity is truly meant to do. And that's why people used to talk about diversity. So when people see the value of the dollar declining or they see inflation, um, how do you get the average person like me to understand that gold can still be appreciating or that gold can protect right. against that stuff? How, how does that make sense for people? You know, the, the easiest way to look at it is if you look at gold, right? Gold is the anti-dollar investment. As a dollar gets weaker, gold gets stronger. And we know that because it takes more dollars to buy that gold, just like cars cost more now, right? Um, anytime you have inflation, the item that you're buying costs more. The difference with gold is that it doesn't devalue. It's considered a alternative currency. Basically, when you say that I don't have complete faith that this financial system is not built on a house of cards or I don't have complete faith in in what the current Fed is doing to fight inflation, this is where gold comes in. And this is where we see people increase their amount of gold because a diversified portfolio should have some gold regardless. We need to remember that the United States Fed says 2 to 3% inflation is ideal. So that means for the average saver, if your retirement account's invested and it's based in dollars, that you're going to lose 60% of your purchasing power to inflation by the time you're ready to retire. And that's under the best of terms. And now we can talk about the, oh, it's transitory. Oh, no, maybe I was wrong. Um, maybe we need to do half basis points every month for the rest of the year and then see where it's at next year. These are scary things that mm -hmm. the experts are trying to tell us that, maybe we didn't have it right. And this is why people have gold and this is why it offers that protection. It's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I think people think, well, if I'm investing in gold, do I actually possess the gold in, you know, I have it in a safe. Do I have, how do you get gold? How do you keep gold? Right. And, and physical gold. I mean, this is what we do. So yes, if you're buying it outside of an IRA, we can deliver it right to your home and you can put it in your own safe. You can put it in your safety deposit box. If you don't feel comfortable with that, we do offer storage for our clients as well, okay? So there's lots of options. Uh, in the IRA, it's stored for you, just like your IRA account. You don't have access to those stocks. So if you were to take funds from your IRA, you could make that investment and you'd have the retirement account invested in the precious metals as well. And it would be handled just like every other IRA account. That's really interesting. And, and now I'm going to ask you a tough one, and I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm just going to be candid uh, and, and a ask what I think might be coming to people's minds. Sure. If the experts in Washington are making all these mistakes or they were wrong about inflation, then they're going to look at you and say, hey, Charles, why should I trust what you're telling me and why legacy precious metals is the place to go. I'm, I'm asking this in an honest sure. way because I because I I know you want to be transparent about this stuff. So how would you Absolutely. answer that? You know, it really is is I'm not a politician. Um, <laughs> I have no desire to be a politician. I like what I do. Right. I help people prepare their finances. I help people with their retirements. I help people set up their funds so that their children and their grandchildren have something that's there. This is what I do. This is what I do for uh, enjoyment. Um, uh, very big in economics. Um, um, but metals is that thing that it's an alternative asset, right? When I was a stockbroker 30 plus years ago, it was unique kind of then. And then everybody was a stockbroker and everyone had stocks and there was nothing different. There was no protection. Everyone said the same thing. To me, it didn't make sense for everyone to be doing the same thing. If we all do the same thing, then we all fall together. And we know that if you follow the government's direction, you're buying into whatever they want to sell you. Now, it used to be politics was a little different. We've gotten into a place where we can't say that anymore. It's not always for the people. It's We see that. We see that what they're doing with the economy itself. We know that 
we have to have something else. And this is why we do what we do here at Legacy. And my history is is why people should, you know, give us a call, chat with us and see if it makes sense for them. Last thing I want to ask you about is I remember 2008 and I know a lot of people Mm do. And, you know, that was a crash and there have been other crashes. But why is it that when the economy crashes, gold has historically risen? I know you said it's sort of the anti-dollar. Right. Is there a way in layman's terms to explain why that happens? It's it's the safe place. Right. When, when, when there's so much risk out there and people are losing so much money, they just want safety. Mm-hmm. So l- let's look at inflation. We know right now we're running close to eight and a half percent. Yeah. Uh, we can dig some real numbers out there and we can debate that, but we'll just take that number as it is. We'll use eight percent. That means everything costs you eight percent more this year than it did last year. And we know it's going to go higher because the Fed's already promised us a lot more interest rate raises, right? To fight inflation, but we know it's not enough. When they say things like, we'll try to raise half a basis point five times over the next six months and see where the economy's at next year, that in itself lets you know you need to find something that doesn't put your livelihood in their hands. They're, they're juggling an economy and the stock market. And it was never meant to be that way. So you have to protect yourself. And this is where gold comes in because it is the anti-dollar. The weaker the dollar gets, the stronger gold gets. And, you know, 2008, I remember after it happened, um, the people that would call and try to salvage their retirement accounts. And it was a very devastating time. People would call and they would be crying that they can't retire now. They have to continue to work. They're 67 years old and their plans are gone because they lost half their value. And that's devastating, you know, but this is where those who were involved in gold, they saw gold almost double in price. It offset the losses. It offset the losses. So again, Charles is not suggesting that you put all your money in one place that not even gold, but diversify your assets and precious metals is a good way to go. And legacy precious metals is the only company I trust when I talk about and do my investing in gold and silver, and you can contact them as well. Legacypminvestments.com, legacypminvestments.com. I don't know why you would waste another minute thinking about it. Just talk to them. I mean, just ask them, see what your situation can can manage and handle and might require and just get some answers. Uh, Charles, I appreciate your time. Thanks for this. It's been very educational. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.